I love fixing things. And it doesn't have to be a vintage computer tied up in nostalgic yearnings from my misspent youth. I get the same buzz from successfully bringing a washing machine back to life. And I save a few quid along the way too. It doesn't get boring for me either. And I hope it doesn't get boring for you too. YouTube seems full of new vintage tech channels these days, which can only be a good thing. Fixing 14 Commodore 64s in a row was a bunch of fun for me, and apologies for not sharing much of that. I selfishly kept all the fun to myself. And whilst it's not entirely accurate to say that every one of them was different, it's fair to say that most of them were, in some way, a new challenge. Not the ones with broken PLAs though. Those were dull as dishwater. I've only fixed a few Sinclair ZX Spectrum 128K Pluses or Toast Racks, and sadly all of them have so far just been bad DC-DC conversion components. I've not had anything meaty to get my teeth into, so when Paul sent this to me, my eyes lit up. My immediate response to that image with its vertical lines was, bad RAM, no doubt there. Paul packed up the Toast Rack and posted it over to me, and here it is. Shall we see if I was right? I've got this on the bench from Paul Universal Retro Boss and it is a 128k Spectrum Plus toast rack. So let's have a look at the fault. So if I flick the power switch on, that's what we get, which screams RAM in that pattern. So let's quickly run through what to do with a broken, well any broken computer really, I'll switch it on. Uh, the first thing I did actually, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm starting to do this more and more is uh, connect up um, a thermal camera. I know this isn't some, something everybody's got, but it's the same principle if you use your finger, if you've got sensitive fingers to, uh, to heat. But I haven't, I've got really insensitive fingers. So I can't, I can't feel, I can't feel the difference between a hot and a cold chip. Okay, so I've got my thermal camera pointed at it here and it's switched on. It's drawing 890 milliamps and I've got a couple of hot spots. So the, the voltage regulator there is nice and toasty at, what is that? 26 degrees, it's not even toasty. It's barely above room temperature. One of these chips here, this one is 32 degrees. This, um, what is that? A PAL? 10H8CN chip here is, um, it's got a nice glowy spot on it, but that's not hot. The, the ROM is not hot. The Z80 is 50 degrees, which is fairly normal for a chip from 86. And this mega ULA is 55 degrees. Again, not a problem. I can I can't even feel that. Uh, and the the video chip, the TEA 2000, is warmish, and all of the RAM is stone cold. Okay, so that was that's the first thing is just quickly check for heat, and also visual clues. So things like in a 128k spectrum, this toroid can uh, work its way loose. It's it's meant to be glued down. And very often they'll, you know, they get knocked about. That breaks free of the glue and and shifts over and can short things out. So that's some a good thing to look out for. Obviously, checking for bulgy caps. They all look really good. Very. I haven't changed any capacitors in a 128k spectrum. Oh, that's quite neat. I'm going to take a photograph of that to show you. That is quite neat. A couple of resistors bridged up. That's lovely, that is. I love stuff like that. So, right, so the next thing would definitely be the, um, the diagnostic cartridge. So we'll plug that in, switch it on. And it's good that even though it had all of that on-screen corruption, it still manages to display a perfect image. So that's promising. That's, that's saying that almost everything on here is, is um, all of the major chips are actually fine. The RAM is faulty. So it's gonna be a really nice, simple fix, I hope. 
So I see 16 and 18, but it's a good idea to check if, uh, if they're consistently faulty. So I'm just going to switch that off and then switch it back on again and see if it comes up with the same error. Excellent, so that's two out of two. Right, apologies for the noise. Um, I didn't realize that the capture was uh, making a horrible buzzing noise and it all gets, the way I'm recording this, everything gets captured together. So it's to, I can't in post uh, separate the audio sources. Hmm, I wonder if I could record them on different channels. That's something to think about. Um, but you know, look, I'm gonna put this back on. I've connected the oscilloscope and I want to probe. Um, so all of the data lines, if I show you all, that, all of the data lines on all of the chips are there. Uh, if I go over to IC16, which is over here, and the, um, the data lines are fine on there, and 18 the data lines are fine on there, and Everything else actually looks very normal on um, on this. This is IC18. That's the data line. Okay, and this is 16, so that's that data line. And these are the address lines. They look a bit squished. That one looks a bit different to no, that one. Oh no, it's about the same. Um, there's nothing that I can see that looks oh that's that's something missing there yeah there should be what's that pin pin 11 that is all oh, oh hang on it might no it's just a bad contact everything looks all right so I wouldn't have been able to pick this up with just an oscilloscope. But that's not to say that the memory is the issue. It could be something else. It could be this big, actually, that's a good idea. This, uh, the ULA, let's change that for a, a one that we know that's working. This has been on my workbench before. This is one that um, has a damaged toast rack section and also a melted case. But apparently, uh, and I've previously repaired this one and I didn't this not not been in a video um but this was just a previous repair for Paul and then I sent it back to him and he said that um somebody told told him that this is a more not rare but not a common um issue motherboard so let's have a look yellow numbers that mean anything to anyone not to me <laughs> Actually, I'm not sure whether this one is actually working or not. Oh no, I, yeah, I got this back in it and plugged it in and it's working fine. So I'm not sure why Paul wasn't able to get it working, but let's just, for completeness sake, plug it in and see if it works. Yeah, works fine. Okay, so this is a known good one. Right, so this is a version 6K and this is a version 6U. I um, don't know. Whether that actually means anything or not, I really don't know. Do not like these sockets. Right. Probably would have been quicker to do it without the test card in. Right, 16 and 18 still, so no change there. Don't see that the ROM could affect that. Should I check that ROM? I've got one right there. Probably really should. Right, no diagnostics plugged in. Let's see what it does. Same. A little bit less flashy. Right, exactly the same. So, not the ROM. <laughs> I 
Well, that's not done the best job this time. And I think it's because is the tip that I was using before with this one mil hole in the end. And now I, I had actually switched to the bigger tip because I was having better luck with it with on a different board. And I thought I could just continue to use it. So uh, I'm gonna switch back to the one mil tip and redo this. Let's get that equalize a little bit. I'm just gonna re-solder these and, and do it again. because I'm just not happy with the way it went. It's a new tool, so I'm, I'm just getting used to it. Let's try again. Yeah, that looks all better already. Yes, so much better. All the holes are much clearer on the other side. Now, sometimes you get boards when they've been built that um, the chips have been jammed down into the board when uh, they were when it was put together. Yeah, this is coming out. I don't even need to use hot air on this one. Um, and it's, this feels like one of those boards where they've shoved the chips in really hard in order to get them to stay where they're supposed to be while they solder them in. All right, uh, these are 4164s, aren't they? That one, dead. Oh, it's not in there properly. Nope, still dead. Excellent, good job RAM test. Let's get the other one out. Because this one hasn't had two lots of uh, solder applied to it uh, and and been freshened up, this one might need a little bit of persuasion with hot air. So I'm just going to put a couple of pieces of foil on um, the bits around just to protect them. I'm off capped on tape. It it let me down really badly. This stuff is marvellous. This was sent to me by Repairy Muck Repair Face on my Discord channel. Kindly sent me a care package with this and some other cleaning products and just general workbench um, cool stuff. Uh, and I, I always intended to buy some of this foil tape, but uh, never just never got around to it. And always just muddled by with what I've got. And there's so many other examples of things in the workshop that like that where I, I should really get that thing, but never do. You just put up with what you've got. But this is a quality of life thing that really does make a big difference. Right, 330 degrees, 50% airspeed. Oh, I'm heating the wrong chip. <laughs> right, let's see what difference, if this one's faulty as well. Yes, this one is faulty as well. Right, sockets in there, new chips, and then let's see whether that's all there is. It could be more chips. These were sent in by a viewer. I, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. At the best of times, I've got a terrible memory for names uh, and faces, but I will um, I will look through my message history and find their name and put it up on the screen. There. And they very kindly sent him in a big bunch of 4164 chips uh, for me to use in my repairs. The legs are all a bit snaggly, but um, if they work, they work. 
suppose we'd better check it first. Get in the right way. Perfect, all green. Green. So was that all of them? Ready? No. There's something wrong. So if there's two chips, there's gonna be another one or two or four. I see 15. Okay, at least it's a different chip. Uh, everything's still hot, so we can just whip that chip out. Okay, so I, just, I was just about to start taking this chip out. I wasn't gonna record it because there's only so many of these things that you can stand. Can you see right there? Keep it in the middle of the screen. There's some corroded legs on this is IC15. I wonder if there are any on the other chips. No. Oh, there's a little bit on this must have been next to it. This one must have been next to it. There's a little bit of corrosion on that one as well. Looks like it's had something spilt on top of it. Right, chip is out. Let's have a look. Another dead one. Right, that's that chip change. Let's see um, if it um, wants to work now. Ready? Ooh, looking a bit more promising. Yay. It's happy. Testing interrupts. Yes. See, it's always the RAM. I'll try and hide the smug look on the inside of my face. So in conclusion, the diagnostic cart, this one here from Bite Delight, was the key to fixing this machine. Sometimes these things can give inaccurate reports which lead to replacing the wrong components and because that happens, it's often difficult to trust them. And that not being backed up by the oscilloscope too, something I've come to rely on more and more in my fault finding. Add to that, there were no hot chips. The only other thing that could have given me a slight clue were the corroded legs on one of the faulty ICs. But even that alone would have only got me part way there. This whole process is becoming more and more reliant on approaching the problem from multiple angles and finding my way to the answer that way. Sometimes they're predictable and sometimes they're not, but they're all fun. Thanks for watching. See you in the next one. Moo! I don't know what that was. <laughs>